conservative publication called the American Conservative calls uh, Islam the last <laughs> badass religion. And I, I, I thought that was a great headline. And because yeah. it's, um, it's a fantastic way to express what many conservatives are actually feeling right now because the church isn't really uh, helping them out because the, the church is actually going more towards the left and it's um, introducing um, homosexual priests and trans priests and all that. And um, American Christians are now looking towards Islam and say, hey, how, how are you? How are you? Yes, because they, they they don't have any backbone. They yeah. have, they've interpreted, they've made their text so uh, loose and um, up to interpretation that um, anything essentially goes. And it's basically be biblical studies have become under the guise, or they've fallen under the uh, postmodernist view. For those who don't understand what postmodernism is, postmodernism is a type of philosophy that emerged um, maybe a, a primarily about 20 or so years ago. Um, but nowadays, um, it's an old philosophy that's been going around for a while, but it essentially says your truth is your truth and nobody else can say that your truth is wrong because your truth is what is true. So, in effect, if you look at the biblical um, reading through that lens, through the postmodernist lens, when you're looking at truth and what the message or the teachings of Jesus is under um, a way where you are interpreting it in a nonsensical way, a way that doesn't uh, correspond to any of the previous teachings or any of the biblical scholars, doesn't follow any of their traditions, then it's effectively fallen under postmodernism because you you've completely broken off the the chain of tradition that yeah, that come yeah. off. So so I think to be fair, this is a problem that is unique to reformist Jews, reform Judaism, and Protestantism. But it is it's affecting Islam too. There yeah. are Muslim academics, such as the the people who were going against the uh, differences in narrative letter, yes. who are trying to say that oh the scholars. Of Islam today, they're not inheritors of anything. Right. They, and, there's no tradition oh, in Islam. You can interpret Islam the way you want. That's what the statement was saying. I, I wish we had talked about that a little bit more. It, the the psychological or the uh, philosophical view that some of these uh, leftist people have. But but again, that's a Ooh. that's a super minority among Muslims. When yeah. I say among Reformed Judaism and Protestantism, the reason why I say this is something that's biting them in the rear end now because theologically this is embedded, and I'll explain. Eastern tradition of Christianity heavily believes in patriarchy and the church fathers and tradition and saints and they believe that iconography, they believe in all of that, meaning that there's a tradition of well-established religious church fathers that they have to follow. Protestantism, Cal you know, the, the other group, the Calvinists, they came out, they follow something which is called sola scriptura, which means that it's basically what you would compare it to is the Quran only, right? And, mm. and so they're Bible only. And so what they believe is that the Spirit guides people. The Holy Spirit. So when you, when you hear the evangelicals yeah. say, oh, the Lord put the, the Spirit put it on me, that this is what's going to happen, or this is what I should be doing. God guided me. The Spirit talked to me. The Holy Spirit was talking to me today and told me to do this, right? And so when they use this form of thinking, one could come out and say, the Holy Spirit told me that God is love, and He loves everybody, and everyone that's accepted in the kingdom of God. Right, and how do you def how do you how do you objectively refute that? You can't if you believe yeah. that the Spirit talks to everybody, and there's no church tradition, and the Bible is authority on itself and stands on its own, and, God, and the Spirit can talk to everybody. There's no authority, hmm. right? And the only authority is the Bible, and then your subjective understanding of the Bible. And Reformed Judaism has the same thing. They don't care about what the rabbis say about the Talmud and the Mishnah and the Gemara. They care about what the Torah says. And so they will be given the wisdom to understand. God will give them wisdom to understand the Torah. And so they understand, well, that law was for that time, and it's not really for now. And so people who brought this, time, this, this kind of Reformed uh, theological discussion about uh, removing tradition from it, right? Uh, we see them now, this is biting them in the rear end. Because all these evangelical Baptists, they can all claim now that they have an authority because God, the Spirit, or, or God has given it to them, hmm. right? And whereas traditional Islam uniquely 
has largely in this case has I think unanimously for centuries, even even now, even the minority that he's talking about, don't, they don't have any positions in scholarship in Islam. Like no one looks to them to be like, oh, what's the fatwa? But I think unanimously, Muslims always believe we have a chain of authority. Of course. The imam just can't come out and say what he wants to say. It has to be backed by tradition, by a hadith, by Quranic verses. There has to be a precedence within Islam for someone to come out and say something. Yeah. And you yeah. know, this is nothing new. Like you're talking about liberalism and postmodernism. Look, these things things have always occurred in history islam has always dealt with these types of uh groups and these types of ideologies they just have a different name now right yeah. so a uh, awesome brother that um you know i've been recently working with uh his name is brother tahseen he's a, he's a specialist in theology and he and he brought to my attention something really awesome um some of the groups some of the factions that split from islam one of them known was known as the india Indi means like according to yeah, me. Us, yeah. yeah. And they were known as the India. Really? And the India, they were the first like liberal ever like idea that branched off from Islam. Right? And if you look at and if you read What time period was this? This I think was like uh six hundred years to eight hundred years after Hijrah, possibly. Um or you know, something like that. It was actually it was probably like six hundred years from, from our time period. So he so when I was looking up a few things, it, this arguments are exactly the same. According to me, this doesn't make sense. You know, so I we don't really have to deal with it this way. And Allah is Ghafoor Rahim and He's Rahma and this and that. And He created us mm. with intellect and our intellect. And it, it's like a hybrid of something that the Mu'tazila would do, right? Mm. If it doesn't make uh, intellectual uh, sense to me, then I'm not going... It, it, it's not actually what Allah actually means because... And, and this is where shaitan comes in with the waswas, right? Yes, because the, the, the Mu'tazilites believe that the uh, the knuckle has to make sense of the aql. Yes. If it doesn't, then you reject it. Exactly. It has to occur naturally in the mind. Okay, you have to explain what knuckle and okay. is. Knuckle means like, divine revelation or text, yeah. right? And aql is intellect, yeah. right? So what they argue is that if the if the intellect cannot understand the, the divine revelation, then you have to categorically reject it. Yeah. Because it has to make sense to the intellect. And they because start off with saying that if you, not even just, it, it, so this is where how things lead into domino effects. It didn't actually start off with categorically reject it. It was like, you know what, you could just leave it. And, Reinterpret yeah, it. Yeah. And not, not only that, you just leave it. You don't yeah. have, you're not bound by it, but just leave it at that. But it doesn't, it wasn't, nothing is ever just left at that when you leave. Islam meaning there was no importance meaning it wasn't anything significant because the intellect couldn't exactly grasp it. and then and it became this, categorically rejected from this by the way you have the birth of people who were known as the Bataniya like they believe that they had the esoteric understanding of these verses uh, the, uh, everything was ambiguous you know how in the Quran we have muhkam which is the clear and mutashabih which are the allegorical but for them everything was metaphorical so whatever and only a select few of people who were elevated in their understanding had the, had the ability to interpretate these verses and be able to tell you yeah. what the true message is. Yeah. And so in that one, again, this is the same thing. What it's saying is that when we see today, with we just mentioned earlier, that when you give, when people then take the authority upon themselves to say, this is what Allah intended to say. This is what we should be doing. This is how we do it. They are effectively saying that there's no need for divine uh, 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 messengership, meaning that the Prophet had no, there's no purpose in the Sunnah, there's no purpose in tradition, there's no, the, all the things the Sahaba did, it means nothing to them, the, 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 the hundreds of years of scholarship means nothing, because all of that is just interpretation. Mm -hmm. in, in order to believe what they believe, you'd have to believe the Prophet was just in, was just making up interpretation as he went on yeah. to what he saw fit. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't as the Quran says that whatever he speaks is from is not from his desire, but it is an inspiration to him. Mm -hmm. right? revealed, yeah. yeah. So, um, but they, they effectively they didn't realize it, but eventually they come out. What's interesting is eventually they come out saying this that. The Prophet was just simply a delivery boy, and that you no, know, uh, whatever he says about the Quran, is that it doesn't really matter hmm. because the Quran is itself. The Quran, this eventually later on developed to the ideas of the Quraniyun, the Hadith rejectors. They said, no, all we need is the Quran. We don't need anything else. The Prophet simply doesn't have an authority over anything. Whatever the Prophet said, it ha either it had to come from the Quran or he can't speak about it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you're mentioning all this. Look, all of these things happen in the past and they're always going to repeat themselves. They just have a different name and a different guise. But right? what I wanted to say was, look where they ended up. 
Yeah. Today, who are they? Today, either the deviant Rawafid, right? They're Ismailis, right? Ismailis are one of them. But even the Shia today, the Shia, the 12 verse, have remnants of this. They choose, for them, the five pillars is one of them is Al Aqal, the intellect. It's not to, oh, no, 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 don't think they believe in Shahadatain and Umrah, I mean, Hajj, Zakah, Sawm, Ramadan. No, 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 these are later. <laughs> the Aqal is the first. The, the Wilaya is one, it is Aqal. There's, um, you know, Qiyama, there is wilaya, uh, Imama. All, they have a different understanding. Yeah. But this is an influence of the Mu'tazilites on them, hmm. right? So all the deviants, for example, the Ismailis, uh, and even, uh, I mean, the, today, the Zaydis, the Ithna Ashra, the, uh, the um, what do you call, the um, uh, Alawites, the all these deviant, all these deviant the Baha'is, all these people that have deviancy, that have break up, who have broken apart from the Jama'a of the Muslims, that people all view as weirdos, they stem from this, these radical movements or mm. this, uh, this, 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 this departure from traditional scholarship and tradition. Yeah, and that's why today you see the same thing. But Islam, this is what I was going back to earlier. We are in a unique position because Allah made it very clear that Allah and His Messenger are. You have to obey them, and you have to return back. Even if the people of knowledge differ, they have to return back to Allah and His Messenger. So we have a very strict. It's confined to to a tradition that we have, right? Other other religions didn't have that, but because of that. We're able to combat and protect ourselves from these deviant groups. These people don't have that. So we're at an advantage. As long as we stick to what we believe in, we're going to be safeguarded from it. Yeah. But they don't have, theologically, they're bankrupt. For so, us, we have that grounding. Yeah. So that, that's what the article is basically, uh, at least one of the excerpts here says. That's something I respect about the Muslims in general. They take their faith seri a lot more seriously than we Christians do. The only forms of Christianity that are going to survive the dissolution now upon us are going to be those that are serious about the faith and incorporate in dis into disciplined ways of living. What would it mean for Christianity to be badass? Not violent or intimidating or cruel, but serious and counter-cultural. This is one reason that Orthodox Christianity is so attractive to men. It sets, it sets serious challenges in front of you fasting prayer and so forth yeah. and expects you to rise through those challenges it's not rigidly dogmatic or and moralistic certainly but but it's not sentimental either it sees mm -hmm. christian life as a pilgrimage towards god in which we die to ourselves every day that's not moralistic there that's not moralistic therapeutic deism that is faith uh, so it goes on talking about different excerpts from uh, Shadi Hamid's book, uh, Islamic Ex Exceptionalism. Um, and, and there's a awesome other parts of that article that are worth looking at. Check it out if you guys have, if you have a chance. It's I, 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 ironic. It's crazy. I didn't read the article, but he mentioned exactly what I was saying. The Eastern tradition, they're rooted in scholarship, so they have those traditions. It sets a standard. Mm. Other ones, they have no standard. Literally, you can you can go down now to a church yeah. and see an, uh, we love God loves all and the rainbow fl the flag next to it. You know what? You want to be lesbian? God loves you. You want to be sleeping with prostitutes? God loves you. You know, just say G because for Jesus. them, yeah, Jesus. Well, no, it's not even about that. More, I, I think we should go even deeper than that. It's it's not even about God loves you or God doesn't love you. It's about disregard whatever the teachings are. And that lifestyle is very welcome here. That's what they're trying to teach the Muslims to do. It's not even what God love you. No, no, that's, no, no. That's, I'm, I'm saying for them, it's that because yeah. their theology is bent. So what they're doing is that here's the thing. Okay, again, this is uh, it's important to understand. I'm mentioning this not because it's gonna it's it's something they're attacking the Muslims with. Exactly. The yes, sir. theological differences that happened, Alhamdulillah, Islam was able to repel them. Yeah. But in their case, it became half of their population. Imagine if the Shia became, or the, the Mu'tazilites remained half of the Muslim population, mm. right? Or the Andiya, if they became half the population. That's how they are, right? So in this case, when I say God loves you, why is that? Because theologically they say it's by faith alone that you're, you're saved. <laughs> Meaning the actions don't matter. So what they are, they have irja, the murja. So in a sense, meaning the irja basically means that it's only what you believe in your heart. Okay, and this is a problem. The scholars spoke about this. There were groups like, that came out mm -hmm. like, and said, don't judge anybody because, and this stemmed from a, the a bigger theological or philosophical problem that we don't have free will. 
Allah controls everything and we just do what Allah will do we did anyways. They, they say the irada of Allah is that it's one will. So we don't have actually control over anything. We just do, it's all pre-programmed. So they said that's why you don't judge anybody. Because as long as they have faith in their heart, that's what counts. Mm. And these Christians who had this view, they never may had this view with the intention of being pro-gay. This started very early on. What it was is to circumvent the Sharia that Allah put over them. Hmm. You don't worry about not eating pork. Don't worry about you know not keeping the Sabbath. Don't worry about not wearing hijab. Don't worry about not fasting. Because you believe in God and He loves you and you love Him and that's enough. That's your salvation because Jesus died for you. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So what they're doing now is they're trying to tell the Muslims that they think that the Muslims will also be receptive to that because the message sounds nice. But alhamdulillah, the Muslims, for the most part, our theology is different. It's based on work. Yeah. It's based on Iman. We know that no one will get to Jannah without the mercy of Allah, but it requires you to do work. Yeah. Right? Well, but that even that little snippet, I'm going to come back to when she said, some Muslims, not all Muslims, right? What not only does that that type of language, and she's just speaking her mind. She's she's right. There's some Muslims that were there on that panel that were pro the agenda and that that were not for the agenda, right? But what that does is that makes Muslims even understand. Look, it's not that she's being malicious or malevolent. Muslims, you have to understand, brothers and sisters. At the end of this, don't be surprised. If people who are not okay with this are going to be the extreme minority in our societies, because that's something we have to expect. Hopefully it doesn't happen, but it's very possible. People like you and I that are talking about these things, we can be one of every 10 Muslims. We don't know that, right? So one of the polls, I can't remember what it was. The name of the poll was that Muslims in support of LGBTQ lifestyle and their rights and everything included and are willing to be allies surpass the numbers percentage wise of muslims in the united states and canada compared to evangelical christians right muslims are more in support so what when we say that muslim islam is the last religion standing what it means is it's the religion that has the system and principles set up which it operates out of to take care of this issue and stand up to it appropriately and not fall on a principle level of a religion. Will Muslims fall individuals? Of course they will. We see it. I mean, Allah is displaying that for us right now, that there's people amongst you that claim that they're Muslim. They're pro all of this. Yeah. Right? They're pro all of this. And so when we say that Muslims are not susceptible to falling, no, Muslim Islam's not susceptible to fall, but Muslims will. And some of the people that you love very, very dearly are going to be pro LGBTQ lifestyle because they're a part of this bandwagon of democracy and extreme right or on, uh, extreme left or just on the left because that's the cultural identity marker that helped Islam flourish to them being under the guise of, Demo of, of the Democrats. So they have to follow everything through with the Democrats and whatever their gang chooses, if you're against it, they're going to be against you. It's, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. And it's not a means of panicking. It doesn't mean you have to panic or be alarmed. Just know that it's just the way that Muslims have always been in this world. People who hold on to the deen. And you mentioned all those sects and those groups. What do you think the wisdom of Muhammad is saying is that you're going to break up into this many sects, 70 some sects, right? And there's only be one group that's going to be successful. Every single one of these groups that happened after the generation of the Sahaba that started forming, right? After the generation of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, every single one of them is not new to all these sects and groups that are here right now. Every single one of them still exists. They just have a different name. And Islam... Islam successfully dealt with them and showed us how to deal with them. Allah showed us in history that these people are going to keep coming back because it's satanic, but they're just going to have a different guise. And how these people dealt with them, the original generation, this is how you have to deal with them. You stand up strong. Look, Imam Ahmed al Hanbal was, you know, I think uh, Sheikh Safi Khan was the one who named it the last man standing or something in his four-part series that he did like 15 years ago about uh, Imam Ahmed al Hanbal being the Imam of Ahl Sunnah, and the Is it Safi Khan? Dr. Safi Khan, yeah, okay. from from College Park, Maryland, right? Um, and it was a beautiful four part series. Um, the last time I heard it was probably like almost twelve years ago, <clears throat> but it still is a beautiful in in the history, very historically accurate. And that did happen to Ahmed bin Hanbal when he was in jail. And people were telling him, dude, just say the Quran was created, and all this is going to be finished. So imagine him being one of the last scholars. 
And other scholars in secrecy supported him, but they didn't want to say it outward, outwardly because they were afraid of the ramifications and everything. And uh, I understand, it's very intimidating, right? But that's what he signed up for as Muslims. So Ahmed ibn Hanbal, he looks out the window of his jail to the people that are visiting him in jail. He said, you see all these people that are just walking the streets, minding their own business? If, there's, if I fall, not saying that I'm Ahmed ibn Hanbal, I'm great. If there's nobody else that falls, every single one of them is going to believe the Quran is created. Right? So there has to be a stand. Muslims have always made a stand. And if you think you don't have the guts to, rest assured, there's always going to be a group from the Muslims that are going to stand up. If you think that is too difficult for you, so be it, bro. You know what I'm saying? We forgive you. But there's always going... Well, I, inshallah, I'm a part of those people too. But whatever happens when Muslims start collapsing, because it's happening now, Muslims are succumbing to this. And this is a new fitna. I firmly believe this is one of them. Because you have corporations that are backing all of this. If it makes money, it makes sense to them. And the government is very much bound by these corporations because it's, it's what brings in... Uh, popularity, revenue, strength, and power, and everything, and candidacy, and everything. All of, all of our politics are based off of what the corporations have in store, right? And rest assured that this is going to grow and it's not going to end here. I believe that parents are very, very much going to be targeted by the LGBT community who claim to be peaceful. They will attack Muslims. There are going to be people that are from, 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 uh, uh, um, uh, from on a governmental level. Um, that are just going to turn an eye to certain types of hate crimes that happen to Muslims or other people alike that are against this agenda. But know for sure that there's always going to be a group of Muslims standing against any type of tyrannical behavior or any ideology that occurs. You know what I'm saying? So That's, that's so, all I got to so, say. Uh, I mean, people need to realize too, when we say Imam Abu Ahd al-Sunnah, there's, there's a reason why they attribute that to Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, rahimahullah, because... Had it not been for his stance and the works he put out to refute those that were against him and pressuring him, uh, it could be said that um, the Muslim Ummah would have been like for, yeah. the, for, the, for the large, of I course. mean, until Allah decided to remove yeah. it. I mean, he was the last man standing between the Ummah and that. And other scholars were uh, knew he was correct. But were intimidated and could yeah. not say anything. But tell them why they were. How yeah, how I mean, far did this penetrate? Yeah, I mean, how far did the Mu'tazi idea penetrate? It went all the way to the, the scholars. I mean, no, now the, he's called the Khalifa yeah, was Mu'tazi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he became well. I mean, in his court, he would bring people to say, "If you don't, then he would punish you." Exactly. Openly punish yes. you. Yes. And 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 I, I think the, the to understand the atmosphere here though, is that two things to draw from this. Your don't underestimate what one person can do. The stand of one person can be equal to a million in the sight of yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from You're right. Wills. You're right. Number two is that uh, you have to understand that when, when, when we're confronted with things like this, right? It will bring you back to the hadith that Islam started as something strange and it will end as something strange. You, we don't know. We might be those people that are in that last generation that are the strangers. Yeah, you're and right. you have to be okay with that, because part of believing in what we believe in is the yaqeen and the certainty that Allah is giving us something better. He's given us something better, and He will give us something better in the next life. You may not get everything you want in this life. It may be difficult. You may lose your job. You may lose the comfort. You may make less money. You may not get married as easy, right? You may not uh, be able you to put become children. homeless, bro. Yeah, you may Maybe not end put up in children jail. in the best, the best schools, right? Because, I mean, forget jail and dying. These are very extreme. I mean, it can happen, but I'm saying even the little discomforts that you don't want to give up. For example, I want to send my kid to that school. It's a really top of the school. But are you willing to make sure, uh, are you willing to sacrifice maybe their akhirah that they may have to be forced to learn about this? Or are you willing to make that sacrifice and trust Allah that no matter where he goes, Allah will write for him what is written for him, for that child. Yeah. And Allah will give something better if you... Where is the yaqeen in that? And that's where that yaqeen and that belief, that absolute certainty, that whatever Allah and His Messenger command you to do, there's goodness in it. Yeah. And you know, another thing is that about just difficulty and hardship of standing in the face of something that is either oppressive or something that's outright haram, is look, w let's just keep talking about Ahmed al because his story is beautiful, right? When he's being sentenced to death, he's being carried in shackles and he has to walk. 
And Ma'mun al-Rashid, who was the Khalifa then, right? And someone could say, look, he was a Khalifa and he's known in history. Of course he was notable. Ma'mun al-Rashid had a weakness like any other human being had weakness. He was very, very, he used to gravitate to very mystical and philosophical things. He had an itch inside of him that had, that was very intrigued by that. So when the Mu'tazila used to debate in front of him and used to teach him and discuss these things with him, he was very intrigued by it. But then by the time the khalq of the Qur'an, the creation of the Qur'an idea came in, he was already too invested, right? But there was still something about him that wasn't easy about it, as some historical uh, you know, individual said. But he, he, he built it up so much he had to support it now. Right, and that's why it became problematic. It became part of his identity. It became exactly. It became yeah. part of his identity. Thank you, right? And uh, what ended up happening is that he had sentenced Ahmed bin Hanbal to jail, and he wanted Ahmed bin Hanbal to be executed near the palace. While Ahmed bin Hanbal is being escorted, there's a lady that comes to him and says, "Be have sabr, have sabr." The old lady. He says, "I never seen her in my life." And when the guards bring him, imagine him being shackled, like how he has to walk in the heat with his ankles and his wrists shackled the guards are taking him and as he's approaching the palace he hears a huge uproar of crying of women and screaming of men and then the news comes to him like everyone's like what's happening the guards are trying to keep their composure they find out that Ma'mun al-Rashid died right now there's something very beautiful that can be taken from this as far as hardship Ahmed bin Hanbal passed the test and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the obstacle. And Allah is going to test, you know, Ma'mun al-Rashid or ask Ma'mun al-Rashid of what was, what, what his life was. And we don't have to worry about that because that's between him and Allah, right? And some people are influenced by those people around him. And Allah obviously has more rahmah than, uh, 70 times more rahmah than any mother would, at least, right? Or even more, obviously. But the, the thing here is that even if you're the last person standing, there's many things and karamat and miraculous type things that happen to people in the face of patience. And it also happens to us on a regular basis. We just don't have our eyes open. How many times did you think something was going to go disaster, like a disaster and catastrophically wrong, but something happens that just changes the course a little bit? Is that, does that just happen like by coincidence? No, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protecting you because you passed the test, or even if you didn't pass the test, Allah's still gonna Allah's still gonna change things for you. And even if it doesn't change, the life of the believer is preparation for the next, right? Some no one should think, oh my god, I'm going through all of this hardship and difficulty because I'm holding on to my Islam and nothing has changed for me. Right? There's many issues with that, and obviously we can discuss that in great detail, and it branches off to many things. To you know, to 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 discuss and how to deal with that, but one of them is obviously Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants so much great for you for this test that you did. Any reward in this world doesn't suffice for the amount that Allah loves what you did. So He's saving it for you for the akhirah, right? And we have to have firm belief in this. No matter what the opposition says to us, we're in this point now where the opposition is going to tell us that we're barbaric. The opposition is going to tell us that we're bloodthirsty. The opposition is going to tell us that we're hateful and we want to commit all types of crimes to these people. But in reality, we're just saying what Allah wants us to say. That's it. You know what they would do is they would say... Do you really think Allah is gonna, God is going to punish people just for a choice of who they love? <laughs> that's that's a common um, yes. talking Very point. Common, yeah. They've been saying that quite often. Where did you, where did you hear that last? Uh, do you know how much reading this guy does? No, no. I'm trying to remember which oh, article. Oh, last time you heard it. Uh, because yeah, I, I heard it recently. I heard it so many times. It's just a, it's a go-to sticking point to people who... who uh, do you really believe in such an unloving God? That he would uh, punish someone just for a difference yeah. of who he loves. Someone on Twitter. The last yeah. ten yeah. people I've ever heard this was from Muslims, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the, and, and the oh, idea. you know who it was? It was uh, Michael that the, the Jordan. No, not I'm sorry, not the basketball guy. He's uh, an author, um, Michael something. Uh, Michael, Michael Crichton. Hmm? Michael Crichton. No, no, man. That's that, a, that's... He, he's Michael Crichton the dead. Oh, he is. Yeah. Bro, come on. Oh. Let's try to be sensitive about that. He's one of my yeah. favorite authors. Oh, Don't say Allah uh, Hamu. But listen, um, no, but I mean, uh, um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it, it is a talking point that is constantly being parroted, right? Yeah. The and so that's what the danger behind Michael Knight, Michael Muhammad Knight. Oh, that guy. He he, yeah, yeah, he yeah, recently that's... tweeted yes. that same. 
Uh, but but it's, it's, a very, it's a very common thing. Like, mm-hmm. oh, I don't believe in your version of Islam because the Allah that I know is loving and merciful, right? And it's this thing that... The, I mean, there's numerous problems with this statement. But before we get to that, I just want to say, but it's the guilt tripping they do. Yeah. And for someone in our age group, it doesn't have that much of an effect. We're like, yeah, cool. Yeah, I totally believe Allah would punish people. Look at the story of Noah. Look at the story of... I mean, we know that stuff, right? But for a young child who is trying to rectify this culture and Islam and find their place in belief and solidify what they actually believe, this could be a very confusing Toxic. moment. No, confusing moment for the child. Yeah. We were taught Allah is... He's, he's, he's a Rahman a Rahim. Like why would I mean People Don't mean to do this stuff Yeah It's this using is, feelings they were To born override this the intellect way. Yeah So you know Allah has to love them Allah is merciful He loves you more Than he loves your mother Right And so It appeals to The, the same the, the problem of it is that It's the same way That People Who try to exaggerate About the prophet Do as well too I mean in any way For example Exaggerate about his um, desire to go to jihad Or desire to uh, Be close to Allah Or desire in his zuhud Right You can take any aspect Of the Prophet's life And make him appear To be only that type of individual And you forget about The rest of his character yeah. That's why we say For example You know Right I love that Because it, it brings The duality That the Quran does too About other things Right yes, sir. There's one and two There's uh, There's here And there's the opposite Right And the same thing, with the, the same trap they do there with the personhood of the Prophet, they're doing with Allah. They're ignoring that he is Shadid al Yaqab. Like he is Shadid al Yaqab and that he can bring punishment and he's the most severe of punishment. No one can escape that. There's no mercy from his punishment if he decides it. Right? If he wills it and he's decided on it, then that's his. It, it, you can't, no, nothing can undo this. Right? And uh, likewise, if he wills to forgive you, nothing can undo that. No punishment can come to you. But they totally ignore that. And they choose, it's like willful ignorance to only focus on one side. And what I'm saying is the child may not know that he's doing that. But the one who's presenting the oh, argument yeah. understands that he's doing that. Using and feelings. it's manipulation. Yep. And so obviously it's problematic in many ways because we know Allah makes it clear about who he loves in the Quran and what he dislikes and yeah. what he hates. We know that if someone were to take the Quran in proper context, that's an outlandish statement. However, but my problem and the reason why I'm mentioning this was that they're trying to emotionally blackmail young children into holding these positions, either by saying, you really think that way of God? Like, <laughs> God who's the most loving? You really think he'd be that petty about, mm. about who you love? And the other way is that God doesn't exist. What are you talking about? There's no punishment. What are you talking about? We're all yeah. just, you know, we come from single cell organisms, right? You can say that like about... Well, why does God care about Zeno? Yeah. Why does God care about... Say about everything. You can say that about everything. You why you eat pork? Well, you think God would actually send you to a hell for... It's just a pink little animal that's so I'm cute. pink fuzzy cutie. Yeah. <laughs> He's <laughs> just a big little cute little pig. I mean, we have, we have a friend... Who's eating that? Yeah. yeah. We do have a friend who's really... He loves pigs He's very intrigued yeah, by pigs. Very, yes. <laughs> but guys, but, check but, this no, out. What I'm saying is what well, Sin is right, but the problem is I just want to make this point is that they actually do that. They begin to reinterpret ayat of alcohol. What is drinking? Or yeah. can you get high? What's the big deal? I mean, yeah. that's not... That, and, they, and they even go a further step. They say, then, here's the, the, the biggest problem with it. And I'll let you go right after this. And make the point, Sheikh. But the thing is, I think the biggest problem, though, is that when you make statements like that, it is a form of arrogance. Yeah. That you are speaking on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, mo, the, the, the king of all kings, the one with all the authority, the one who answers to nobody, the one who commands authority, the one who commands obedience. You are speaking on his behalf and that and a, 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 th- there has to be a degree of arrogance to feel comfortable exactly. and say Allah intends to say exactly. this. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And that's the bigger problem. And this is why they go on to say, well, that law doesn't really apply to today. Right? Use your intellect. Yeah. Right? What, what, what does that really mean at the, at the bottom core of it? That my intellect is superior to revelation. Yeah. But even when you talk about arrogance, look how arrogant this is. Look, 
the beautiful thing about Islam is that we have our own definition and paradigm for even every single <laughs> word. The word love, right? They're saying that God, if God is loving, why would he do something like that, right? That statement is coming from a paradigm of making people think you what you consider to be love, that's what Allah considers love first and foremost, right? And this is where atheists actually trip up and they actually make a huge mistake is atheism is very much, especially New Age atheism, is very much depend, dependent on Christianity because they took the idea of love, of what Christians understood, latter Christians understood to be love and mercy, mm. and they equated that to godlessness because there are natural disasters and mm. there is bloodshed. And if there's blood here, bloodshed here, mm. there's natural disasters here, innocent children, women, men, everybody's dying, mm. then there can't be God because this is not love and this is not mercy, mm. right? As Muslims, we have a completely different understanding of what love is. And ours is much greater, our understanding of what love is, of what Allah says, because it's what Allah considers to be love. Yeah. The emotional blackmailing here is very, very evil. I know I keep saying this. It's very, very satanic. Why do I say it's sat satanic? When Iblis deceived from the beginning, Adam alayhi salam, he never said to him outright, don't go to the tree. He just said, no, that's only if you want to be angels. You don't want to be angels, right? And Adam alayhi salam didn't actually understand and know the idea of deception then. He thought everything he heard was going to be truthful from anybody, especially if they're in Jannah, right? He didn't expect that deception to occur. So what ends up happening is that if you tell people and you play with their emotions a little bit, and exactly what Shaitan does, right? Is that, is God really, isn't your God loving? I mean, you think that, so these people are literally uttering what Shaitan has whispered into their ears. Mm. That's why we say, I mean, it's a very profound statement, even it's in the Quran, right? That whenever you read the Quran, read, Why is that important? How many people do you know that took the verses of the Quran and misconstrued it and it became very satanic? Right? Because they didn't fully understand. I have to read this with the lens of how Allah is talking to me about this, not how Shaitan is talking to me about this in the Quran. Hence, you have all these people using the verses of the Quran for this LGBTQ agenda. You have people using the verses of the Quran, like back then, like the Mu'tazila did for the creation of the Quran. And all of that. So, the reason I'm mentioning all this is our understanding of love is not just because a calamity befalls somebody, that it doesn't mean that it means that Allah doesn't love you. That's not our concept of love. Our concept of love is we love what Allah loves and we hate what Allah hates. Because I'm saying hate, people think it's a strong word. The hadith of Rasulullah is al hubbu lillahi wal bughdu lillah. Al hub, love is for the sake of Allah, meaning everything that Allah considers that we have to love, we love it. And people will say, You're robots. Yes, for the sake of Allah, if it's Allah commanding us, yes, we're robots for Allah. That's what makes you happy. If you want to call us robots, yes, for Allah, we're robots, right? It's That's the first level of it, that whatever Allah tells us to love, that we love. And whatever Allah tells us to hate, that's what we hate. Eventually, what happens to the believer is, because Allah created us and He knows us, if we end up following that in every facet of our life, not just one, then what Allah actually ends up loving, you actually end up loving, which is the hadith of Rasulullah is what? That, oh Allah, become, become my right side, become my left side, become my front, become my back, right? Become everything for me, right? Meaning that every judgment you're going to make is going to be accordance with Allah and His Rasul, right? It's a dua, and you can, any, anyone can read that dua. And this is, this is submission. It's full submission. This is when... That's and, what love is. And, 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 and if you think about it, it, it even just, I want to, because I think maybe some people might have not understood, but when you say robot, the idea is that, like, you know when they say fools are in love and they do whatever? Only fools rush in. Yeah, whatever it is, yeah. right? Like, you know, you're foolish when you're in love, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's true. And you do whatever that person wants of to course. do. Of course. And you dislike illogical, and irrational. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Even things that you like and they begin to dislike, you start leaving it. You're like, yep. oh, it's not that good anyway. We've all done it, right? And then even when what they really like, even though you never really liked it, you're like, oh, it's not that bad. It's pretty good. Ah, oh, yeah. And then you begin to love it, right? This is what we're talking about when we say for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That love should be there for your creator. And that love can only come by understanding who he is, what he revealed, what you have to, how you have to live, and understanding the person who brought all that to you. Yes, full submission. When you learn that, 
and you begin to fall in love with the not of course you have love for the creator but you have love you realize that what he sent to you was from love and from mercy and so you begin to embody that you say there could be nothing better for me yeah it could be nothing better for me because i know that allah loves me more than anyone or anything could love me yes, anything sir. And so I'm trusting that love. I have yaqeen in that love. And I yes, know sir. that I won't be abandoned by it. Exactly. And, 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 and this is why we find stories of the Prophet, especially the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Where he says, we found you an orphan and we provided for you. We found you lost and we guided you, right? Trusting Allah yeah. without knowing when his closest ally died, what is he going to do? What's he going to do? Now Quraysh can devour him. Trust in Allah. Yep. Right? When you have to make hijrah, trust in Allah. Right? When you have to go to these battles against in Badr, trust Allah. Yes, sir. Before that, when Hudaybiyah happened, trust Allah. Even if you're outcome. outnumbered. Yeah. No matter how trust outnumbered, in Allah. no matter how illogical going into this battle seems, you're gonna be you're gonna and trust Allah. And the biggest Allah. thing is that the true the true test of that of that of that yaqeen was that when he began to think beyond even Mecca and Medina. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He was talking about Asham and Iraq and yep. Egypt. He was talking about other areas. There were superpowers and nobody would fathom that a small group people of 300 people. People thought he was people. crazy. Of course. Yeah. That would be like the Philippines saying they're going to conquer America, Russia, and, and China tomorrow. Exactly. They're calling right? them people, all out. You're like, <laughs> yeah, you're crazy. Yeah. Right? But one can only be confident in, the, in saying that if you have that yaqeen and you know for a fact that what uh, the creator, what he's saying is 100% correct. Yeah. And look, I'll give you guys a small example that everybody probably heard since we were growing up, right? I want you to see the example of two separate fathers, right? One father wakes his child up for Salat al-Fajr, no matter how difficult it is for the child. And the child's going to be, especially after the age of 10, right? Wake up for Fajr, especially after the age of puberty. I can't. I'm this. I'm tired. You know, let's say the child's 14 years old, right? Some people may say, you know what? Just let him skip this day. You know what? You love your son, right? Don't you? And there's another family that can be like, you know what? No, I don't want to wake him up. I don't want him to fast in Ramadan because it's too difficult for him. I love him He's too much. He's a Yeah. It's in that in Islam, that's not considered love because the true love is making sure that you can stand in front of Allah and say, I put in all the systems, I've exhausted all of my options to make sure that my child becomes also a slave of yours the way you expect me to be the slave and to ensure that I did everything for them to get into Jannah. That's our investment, bro. That's what love is. So even though love is very, very difficult sometimes and it causes blood, sweat and tears, you have to do it. Right? Nobody bats an eye at their coaches when they make them do drills and, you know, run ladders, you know, back and forth until they start throwing up. They actually love their coach and people expect you to keep following the coach. You can't be like, oh, he made me run too much. I'm not going to like him anymore. What type of mercy is that from him? No, they're going to be like, heck yeah, he's making, I put my money in. People are very capitalist. I put my money in for my children to get this coaching. He better work my kids really hard and make men out of them and strong women out of them, whatever the mm -hmm. case is. Right? Mm -hmm. But nobody bats an eye when it comes to that. And I think we see that. I mean, I think all of us know certain families that prioritized religion and the love of Allah and some that didn't. And we see how the children turned out and how yeah. their grandchildren turned out. Yeah. Right? And they live to re uh, to re resent that and to, to regret that. That, oh, the thing that matters... Because here's the irony behind this. As they get older and their mortality is closer, the dunya becomes less important. Anyone who has any iman a little bit in their heart knows they have to meet their creator. Yeah. And when the one of the most painful things, the, the most unloving, mo most unkind feelings is to know that your grandchildren are kufar. Yeah, bro. Yeah, I know. So where is the love in that moment? Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're totally right. The one who woke up his child for, for Fajr, the one that made his child read Quran, when he sees the satisfaction of his grandchildren being hufad of the Quran, yeah. there's no greater love than yeah. that. He doesn't care what he has in this world anymore. He doesn't care if he's broke, whatever, he's got negative $10 in the bank account. He can leave the world saying, yep. Allah, my children are Muslim. Yep, you're right. You're right. It's very Abrahamic.